Welcome to the Quo, a community of challengers, disruptors, and changemakers. I'm your host, Pyle Patel. Join me as I dive into stories at the intersection of gender, race, and social and economic issues. This podcast series spotlights individuals from various industries, disciplines, and walks of life who are challenging the status quo. Through interesting and thought-provoking conversations, the Quo aims to elevate the voices and stories of endeavoring change agents in hopes of empowering communities and inspiring meaningful change within our society through education, advocacy, and the power of storytelling. Are you ready? Let's get it. Hey, cohort, welcome to episode 14 and happy Earth Month. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about our planet Earth and ways to connect to it uh, because it's something that unfortunately many of us are lacking the connectivity to. 93%, that's actually about how much of our life on average we spend indoors. That means we only spend about 7%, that's one half of a day per week. And that statistic blew my mind when I first heard it. And it's even more astonishing when research has shown that being outside is highly linked to improving our mood, our outlook, and overall well-being. The benefits to connecting to nature are endless. And today's guest has a lot of experience and expertise in this space. And I can't wait to chat with her about the significance of connecting to our natural environment, especially as we head into Earth Day this week. So today's guest is Jennifer Walsh. She's a leader and visionary in the beauty, wellness, and retail industry. As the founder and creator of Beauty Bar, she changed the way people shopped for beauty and wellness by creating a first retail powerhouse that allowed beauty and wellness shoppers to see and experience niche and independent beauty products in her brick and mortar stores, and then on her e-commerce website, and then a weekly TV show. It was a first to market, fully interactive experience up until she sold it in 2010. And since then, her career has extended into on-air work, podcasts, and writing, including authoring her own book, Walk Your Way Calm. Jennifer's work now intersects with nature after spending a great deal of time exploring how nature affects our well-being, the many benefits of connecting to the natural world, and even spending time with neuroscientists across the country to learn more about the link between nature and our brains. Her signature wellness walks have become a highly sought after program, which has even led to a special video series called Walk with Welsh, in which she hosts walking interviews and tells stories in a way that drives home the importance of connectivity to earth, which, like I said, is a perfect topic to discuss during Earth Month. So I reached out to Jennifer to ask if she'd be willing to share her insights with the Quo community, and she so kindly agreed, and I could not be more grateful to have her on for a chat I only wish we could be on one of her famous walks outside right now, but I will take a virtual chat for the time being. (laughs) I feel the same way. I so wish we were walking together because I miss seeing you in real life, but thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I uh, feel so honored because I know um, you do a lot of, you know, speak engagements and you talk about this a lot and it's been featured on on TV and in so many different programs. Um, so I feel so fortunate that you're, you've agreed to share your wisdom and um, all the insights you've, you've learned over the years with us. So thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you. I, I, uh, when I met you, I think it was, what, uh, 2019? I feel like that was a decade ago and it was only a few years ago. And I just fell in love with your passion for what you were doing at the time. And I just, um, I've been following you ever since. So it's been, uh, <laughs> I've been, in, it's been like maybe like we've been admiring each other's work for years. So mutual I admiration. Yeah, that's sure. exactly. Mutual admiration society. So Absolutely. thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you're right. It was around 2019. It does feel so long ago because the pandemic kind of felt like a a whole decade in between. (laughs) It's wild. But I did come across our photo together and um, you you were doing a little activation at Navy Pier when I was working there. And it was a wellness uh, related activation at at the pier. So yeah, it was a a, uh, nature reset in 2019 like even before the pandemic so it's really funny that so much has transpired since the last time we were together and last time we spoke in person but it's all in the same exact alignment of like why nature matters so even more so now than ever before 
Absolutely. So I'm going to set the scene for our viewers and listeners and kind of go back to the very start of your career. And you started in the beauty and wellness um, space and retail, like I mentioned in the intro. And that journey journey eventually led you into um, doing a lot of work in nature. And so can you just briefly share that trajectory? How did you um, get started? And when did you realize that there was a link, a connection to what you were doing in that space before into the, the world of, of nature and connecting to the environment? That's a great question because sometimes people just look at beauty as beauty as separate from wellness or separate from how we live our lives. But I've always felt like beauty has been so very connected to how we our well-being and how we feel about ourselves, uh, how we approach ourselves and our, our place in the world. So when I founded Beauty Bar, it was 1997, 1998. It was the pre-Sephora, pre pre-Ulta pre days, really. Uh, I think Sephora was just coming to the US. Um, but I wanted to take a beauty out of a department store setting and make people feel comfortable in my store. And I just want to sell independent beauty brands and not feel like I was being oversold or people being feeling like they had to meet a quota to sell products. Uh, I was a makeup artist by trade, but before that I came from Merrill Lynch in finance. Um, and Beauty Bar was just an idea, like how do I create a, a space where people feel comfortable to try on beauty products that were unheard of? And to be honest, it was very challenging at the time because people had never heard of Stila or Bobby Brown or Fresh or La Mer even though they read about it in the magazines, it was one thing to see it in the magazines, but they might not have really heard about it so or seen it uh, face to face or like philosophy it was just sold on QVC for a long time. So I was doing this TV segment and I thought, well, if I have this um, educational platform as TV, what if I can then have a sales channel as a store? So if I have both together, it'd be a great dynamic to be able to really cultivate brands and tell stories and educate people on what what's happening in the space of beauty. And the brand said, okay, because there wasn't anything out there yet to say no. So um, I got to work with some great, you know, Vincent Longo and, and Janine LaBelle and Lev and Alina who created Fresh and the team behind Kiehl's. And it was just a fun new space. So then I uh, grew the business. I just wanted to have one store. I was there, I was like, I just want to have a place where people can come. And then Ultimately, I was like, well, it'd be great to have another location here. And then people started coming to me saying, can we open, could you open a store in our mall or in our, you know, neighborhood around the country? So the business grew uh, and I was self-funded. I did it by myself. Um, I got married wow. and then we were a team, my husband and I at the time, and uh, had a great group of women that worked with me. And we were, it was just a great time to create because it was new and it was different. And I had a great website. Uh, so again, this feels like make, it makes me feel really old when I say people <laughs> didn't even want to give me their email addresses at the time because like, no, it's too dangerous to give you our email address to, I'm like, Hey, I just want to send you information on what's happening at the stores. Uh, so, you know, fast forward to here we are 20, 25 years later or whatever. It's just bizarre. But I sold the business in 2010. Amazon now owns and I've created a few brands since then. And I've worked with brands both overseas, um, trying to create a footprint in the US. But I've always been like really interested in how people tell stories and how they connect to their environment and how they tell like, what does it smell like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? That's always intriguing to me. Uh, and then in 2016, Facebook came out with this whole video concept of like, you could do live videos. And I'd already been on TV since 1997. So I thought oh, it would be fun to interview my friends that are CEOs or founders in the beauty space. I apologize right now because I, I'm in New York City and there's a lot of sirens outside my apartment. So if you hear it, I'm sorry. Um, All good. Comes with the okay. city living. Comes with city living, right? <laughs> it's the dynamics of the sound. Um, so I said, oh, it'd be fun. And I was interviewing really incredible people doing really great work. But every person that I interviewed said, this feels so good. I never get outside. This is so much fun. This felt so good, but I never get outside. And I thought, that's fascinating that these are healthy leaders leading healthy teams. But there's a disconnect to like, we know it feels good to be outdoors, but why, why are we not allowing ourselves? So people were, I started studying. I'm like, okay, so people only like doing going outside on vacation or on weekends. And I thought, wow, weekend warriors, people were called. So 
why are we only doing that? If we're taking time to go to yoga, if we're taking time to go to the market to get the best food for our bodies, um, we're doing all the things indoors, but we're not going outside. So you should see my apartment right now. I've got like stacks of books all around me that are all about the science of what happens to our bodies and brains and nature. And I, I like I fell down this like rabbit hole and I never came out because I was so intrigued by the, the, the findings of, wow, it's really innately within us to be connected to the natural world. But we put up these walls in the beginning of the industrial age, like, okay, we're, our lives are going to be more like insular and the outside is going to be separate. And, um, and then we became more unwell uh, because of it. So the, the studies and the findings and the data I've been able to talk about and research and meet with, like you said, the neuroscientists around the country I'm going to see a neuro leading neuroscientist at UPenn this week during Earth wow. Week to talk about the brain and beauty, how we view beauty and how our brain connects to that is going to be really fun to kind of dive into as well. So it's been this journey that I never expected at all. None of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, especially when you said that you started out in finance. I did not know, <laughs> know that about you. Yes, so I was like, I you worked at Merrill Lynch? Like, I did. did. You go I from know. there to the beauty industry. And you were a, a makeup artist for a little while as well. Yeah, I was a makeup yeah. artist. Um, and I worked, I was like a celebrity makeup artist. So I was doing makeup artistry for, like, I did makeup for like Pink, Jessica Simpson, uh, Justin Timberlake, 90, 98 degrees when it was 98 degrees, um, uh, Beyonce, uh, Tyra Banks. Wow. Um, yeah, so it was kind of like this pendulum that swung from like, oh, I've done this makeup. Now, like, how about if I open a store and I got to share these? And even from like doing the makeup artistry for like, you know, famous people to like 12 year old girls, like how do I like make it like simple and beautiful, like make them feel special? Like, I don't know, it just, it was like, it's a beautiful experience to be able to like touch people in a way that makes them feel good, even if it's not doing anything more than just being in their presence and just talking to them and just maybe like, putting a lip gloss on them. It's mm -hmm. just about being present in people's space and making them feel comfortable. It's a real special, I think the beauty and wellness space is really special if you embrace it as a one-on-one -on -one versus I'm trying to like sell a million things at once. I think it's a really special place to have conversations yeah. that are that are also in depth and that are sad and that are uplifting and beautiful, that are real. Um, I always felt like people are coming into my home when they came into my store. So how do we treat people like, hey, you're in my living room. How do you want to feel today? I want to feel great. You know, it's how do you address people no matter where they are in life to make them feel the best they can feel. I love that. And it's so true because every time I've interacted with a makeup artist or, mm -hmm. you know, even a hairstylist, like they, there's something about connecting right there. I feel like I, I'm like pouring my life story out yes. to them and, yes. and vice versa, but there's something about it, it, it being in that space and uh, feeling safe enough. And, you know, yeah. they're, they're working on you. You have like, yeah. this, you're their canvas. And so it's almost like, by sharing my story, I'm also contributing to what the, the work they're doing on me. It's just, it's a, it's a really, it's like a spiritual experience for me when it I is. get hair and makeup but also, done. And, but also the room you're, you're creating right now too, is the same, it's the same kind of safety space. So like how mm -hmm. you approach people and how you treat people is exactly how people feel. And they want to then share their stories because of how you make them feel. So I think that's exactly the same kind of space. It's kind of Absolutely. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Storytelling. Yeah. We're both storytellers and I, I yes. love that. Yeah, yeah, always. And I also love hearing when people have had such a, um, you know, a, a career that spanned over so many different um, aspects and into different industries. I, I, It's just really refreshing to hear because, you know, for so long, when we're growing up, you're asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, yes. and people answer that question and it's very singular. It's very, um, you know, tunnel vision minded. And mm -hmm. so you think that like, okay, I'm going to be a doctor and that's all I can be. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's always just like one career option. And I love when I hear people say, well, I did this and then I moved into this and now I'm in a different mm -hmm. space. So like, it's, it's really wonderful that you've had such an arc to your career. Yeah. And again, like I never thought of it, like it was going to, I never thought how I didn't plan for how yeah. I was supposed to go, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, I sold beauty bar and then I was like, oh my God, I sold the business, but I never had a plan. I, I didn't expect to sell it. I'll put it that way. Like it wasn't in my plan to sell beauty bar because I loved it so much, but things happened. It's a whole other podcast, but things happened <laughs> where I was like, okay, I have to sell it when I sold it. And um, then I was like, oh my God, I don't have a, I didn't have a plan B for like, what if 
what if I sell it? Like, what do I do next? So then I had to come up with like, what do I do next? But it's yeah. always been in beauty. Um, and then the arc of like finding nature in beauty was always like, oh my God, it's always been there. But how do I then talk about like the findings of why, like the, the spaces I created for beauty bar, when I created them, I remember you're going to love this. So I was like 28 when I found a beauty bar and everyone, all the old men would come in, old men, I say 40 <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm 51 now. So I could say that, but all the old men of 40 would come and say, you know, you're doing your star, your store is all wrong. It should be pink. It should be like bright light. It should be, and you're putting, you know, you're putting too much focus on the space and not enough focus on the products. And I thought, no, I want men and women of all ages to come here. And I put like hard wood up and like slate walls and lots of natural light and certain sounds in the spaces that I wanted people to feel like they've, they're in a place they've never heard of or felt like they've been in before, but very comforting. Um, not like a spa, but more of like cool, comfortable, funky, unique, but like they could just hang out for like hours, which sometimes they did too often, <laughs> which was great, which is great. But also, um, but they always told me I did it wrong. I did it. They're like, you're doing it all wrong. This is a big mistake. And now 20, like fast forward 25 years later, I found out like that was all biophilic design. So it's how do you create a space where people feel completely comfortable, completely at ease. They want to spend time in their natural elements. I had no idea that that was the epitome of biophilic design, which people are now talking about. And it's always uh, been a part of what I've been doing all these time, all this time mm -hmm. it's been there. So it's yeah. kind of nice. All these important um, lessons and nuggets of inspiration um, coming out of this conversation already with, you know, people telling you what you should or shouldn't do, just follow mm -hmm. your gut there. And then, you know, when you were talking about how this wasn't planned for you, you didn't, you know, but oftentimes yeah. some of the best things unfold that way. You know, I, I was going to be a sports reporter, a sideline sports reporter. Um, and I was so set on that. That was the, the so career funny. I chose as a, as a kid. And so, yeah. you know, I, I, I did do that for a little bit. I got to do that. And then life took me a different direction. And it's still been a, a really beautiful journey. Now I'm trying to figure out the next, next aspect of my journey. And that's also a beautiful chapter in and of itself. So I, I yeah. like hearing that as well. That, it's yeah. hard sometimes too, because like, okay, what am I, what am I supposed, like, where am I supposed to go? Like, where, where am I being called or where am I feeling like I can be of like the most, um, I've always wanted to like, how do I help or how do I bring value? You know, yeah, yeah. Bring value to like what I want to do and share wisdom. Because when I created beauty bar, it wasn't to sell my business. I wanted to create something that people felt comfortable going to. And I never in a million years thought it was going to change the way people shopped for beauty. Like that was like, that was never my vision. It was like, I want to have like a comfortable place. And this is like how I thought about it. Um, and I didn't know it would become what it became. And then since then, it's always been the same. Like, how do I create something that is of value? And how do I make people feel comfortable going through transitions of change? Um, because again, like I'm just following my gut. It's led me down different paths, which have been challenging sometimes, like really challenging. And mm -hmm. um a lot of it, I haven't even like, sometimes I talk about it like on different stages or on different podcasts, but it's been really hard. Like I've gone through really hard, hard times with a divorce and losing everything that I had. Um, how do you like come back up? How do you figure out how do you get through the next things together um, with the people in your life? But I think if you're in the right headspace of like why you're doing it, it's not all about money. And you're going like with passion and like your heart and like the love of life and like how do I create a space of um, health and wellness and positivity and inclusivity and like sharing stories of things aren't like always like hey, it's always great because sometimes that toxic toxic positivity is really toxic so how do you like share like life isn't always easy but it's going to be okay it's going to be okay and um mm -hmm. I think sharing value of like where you come from and where you've been is so gravely important to everyone. Absolutely. And I love that you hit on the why of what you're doing, mm. because that's something that I've been talking a lot about lately. And just, it's just come up in conversations. I just did a, a workshop with uh, my fellow board of directors at UN Women, and it was a find your why workshop. And mm. it's just, um, it's very, it's, I, I really feel like at the very center of everything that we do, if you're if you're doing everything from your why, right? It's like your compass. It, it really guides you towards um, 
success yeah. without pursuing success as as the ultimate goal. If you pursue yeah. your why, you get there automatically. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because you're right. Because I think we always we have a goal. I think we all have a goal for like what you want to create or create a space, whatever mm -hmm. that is. But sometimes I always think like we want to get to a thing, but we miss the whole process of between now and the thing. And the thing can can cannot maybe it's maybe it's what we're supposed to learn is the actual process and not the actual thing. Because I've I've learned that myself. I'm like, oh, I'm creating something, and oh my god, this is going to be great, and it's going to be incredible. And I it wasn't supposed to be the thing. It was actually the process of meeting the people along the way, and um, all the lessons I learned are just so beautiful. But I think when you create a space of like beauty and positivity and kindness, uh, and how to be uh, courageous, uh, but but in a but in a loving space, and not a space where you're. Uh, derogatory or mean towards people, but how do you create a space that's loving and kind of supportive? Because uh, people are always going through things you never, you never really know about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important. Like even nature has showed up in my life that I never, I never thought about, but it's always been, it's always been there. This like thread in my life has always been nature, but being able to share how I've like discovered nature and how I've discovered it's always been a part of like all of our lives. So how do we make it like a part of our health and well-being, it's been really fun to share, and not like, "Hey, you better, <laughs> you, better you better do this." It's more of like, hey, "Isn't this cool?" Like, "Oh my God, I didn't know this." Isn't this like it's we're, we're discovering along the way together, which I think is really, really fun and important. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, I obviously follow your journey on social media on, on Instagram, and I have to say, your content truly does inspire me to get off my butt and get outside. <laughs> you have such a way of spotting and honing in on the beauty around us, and quite frankly, many of us take that for granted in the hustle and bustle of mm -hmm. life, right? So we're focused on getting from point A to point B, and often neglect mm -hmm. to connect with the natural world around us. And so um, I know that you focus on that quite a bit in in your content and in your story storytelling. Um, but I also find that beyond that, the other struggle that I have with mm. getting outside and connecting to nature is living in Chicago and dealing with brutal winters that kind mm. of take up about eight to nine months. And I know you can probably relate with New York yes. weather being pretty similar. Yep. So how do you find motivation to get outside um, in the middle of the hustle and bustle I was talking about? Like we all have busy lives. And you, you alluded to that point earlier saying that like mm -hmm. we've kind of created this um, wall because we're, we're focused on like the day-to-day -day work. And then the other point being, if you're living in a place where the weather's not conducive to getting outside, you know, how do you get around that? Because some, come summertime, I am outside. I love going yeah. for walks, but I just cannot bring myself to do it in the cold months. And I understand. It's so funny because I think about like, so, and I'm, I also have to think about like how I was raised uh, and where I was raised and also like my, my DNA. I'm, um, I'm, I, I'm from my, you know, I am immigrant from Ireland. So my great, my grandparents and my great, everyone's from Ireland. So I'm used to certain like climates, uh, but I also grew up in New York uh, and I was outside all the time as a baby in the, in the Bronx, in the winters, my parents took me out in the stroller and I was like shoved in the snow as a kid. <laughs> I ran in the snow when I was in track. Uh, so I was already used to it. But I okay. think if you come to a climate that you're like, oh my God, this is aggressively cold and you're not used to it, it's very hard, especially if like, I can't imagine someone that grew up in Miami or somewhere like of a warmer climate, no matter where it might be, you come to a climate that's cold, it's going to be hard for you to say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. Like, I hate this. Mm -hmm. This is miserable. Yeah. Well, so I was born and raised in Chicago and I still... I, I, I'm, I've been used to it and I'm still like, I don't want to go out. I don't want to do it. I get it. There's a lot of New Yorkers that are like the same, the same boat. You're at, like, mm -hmm. like, Jen, you're crazy. <laughs> I tend to love, I tend to love, it. I love the cold. I'm not like a man, not, not like many people in New York city that love, but I thrive. Like it's 55, 60 degrees here in April. It's a lot um, cooler than it usually is. And I'm so happy that it's cooler still. I love the cool weather, but then again, I cannot wait like May is going to turn and I cannot wait to start going swimming in the ocean. It's going to be cold, but I'm, I cannot wait to start swimming. So I think it's just a matter of like embracing, embracing it and rather than just saying, Oh, this is awful. And I hate it. Like embrace the, the climate that we're in and just say, okay, this is, even if it's just for like 10 minutes, even if it's just for 15 minutes, um, 
if it's terrible, like, you know, if it's a monsoon or if it's a blizzard and you hate it, I don't go, but try it and create a space indoors that makes you feel like there's life around you, whether it be like plants, whether it be like uh, a fireplace on your TV or you have an actual fireplace. So then I try to encourage people to have those biophilic, um, which is bringing, the, bringing nature indoors. So you actually have nature inside, even if you don't go outside because you're still getting the benefits of it. So even if yeah. you have bird sound on your Alexa app or on your, your TV, Bird song will actually help you calm down and relax and um, give you this like sense of focus, which we never like, I've never, we've not taught this in school, which I, I'm working on changing in my work uh, because it's so important to realize like our bodies are innately connected to certain sights and sounds. And we, we go back to a space of like, oh, like seeing wood, like I'm going off topic, but if you like see wood features in anything in the space, you're like, okay, wood, even if it's, chopped up and put into a table, you see wood, okay, it was alive, it means it's good. Your brain like recognizes this, even if you are not consciously realizing, you're looking at wood saying, okay, wood, alive, good. It's how your brain actually visually sees that. And you're like, I feel comfortable in this space because it was a living thing. Um, same thing with bird sound, like we are programmed from you know millennia that once we hear bird song, that means like everything's calm around us. Uh, if we don't hear bird song, sometimes we're like, oh my gosh, there must be predatory things happening around us and the birds are gone. Because um, even now, if you don't hear bird song, it's because maybe there's a hawk nearby. And I'm recognizing that now because, because of the pandemic that all the birds will go away. You know, I live on like the 11th floor of an apartment, but now all like the the doves and the birds will go away because there's a hawk looming. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's even happening in New York City. The birds will go away because there's a predator around. So we're programmed to know when predators are around, even just by bird songs. So when you hear birds, I'm like, oh, everything's going to be okay. The birds are, you know, they're chiming in and it's a certain time of year. It makes us feel good. That's it's so it's fascinating. It is. Yeah. Like I didn't yeah. think about that primitive primal connection to just mm -hmm. knowing like it's not something I think about. I don't think about the birds and whether or not that makes me feel right? okay. But but I must subconsciously know, yeah. right? Yeah. That like hearing birds chirping in the morning makes me feel like, okay, it's 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 a comforting noise. Spring. It, it feels good. Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah, for sure. So are you saying yeah. that, that you can experience the same benefits of being outside indoors if you were to bring plants yes. in and a lot of na natural um, items? Yeah, it's incredible, Pal. Like you'll, there's so many great, that's why like I get so excited about it because I didn't know, um, but there's some great studies. And again, like I love working with these doctors and scientists, but um, there was an incredible study from Dr. Roger Ulrich in the eighties. So he did this, I think it was like a 10 year study uh, in a hospital. So when you're in a hospital, they're doing the same surgery on different people. And they put some people in a room that faced you know, greenery, whatever the landscape was, but it was outdoors, like water, green, trees, and the other people were facing a brick wall. So the study found that the people that are facing a brick wall needed more medication and um, they lasted in the hospital longer. Those that faced, a, faced greenery um, did not need as much medication. They got out much sooner than those facing a brick wall. It's like, Oh, there's like incredible. And that's just like the tip of the iceberg. So um, even if you looked at nature for 40 seconds, whether it be a picture, uh, whether it be like a photograph in your apartment, um, in an office building, even on your computer screen, that's why a lot of our like, if you're on a on a MacBook, most of the photos on when you get a MacBook is always nature. If you look at it for 40 seconds, your brain is going to be relaxed. Um, it's just this prefrontal cortex are, are like our bodies go into the space of like how we used to be again, like we shut it off for so long that uh, the pandemic silver lining is like, now we're starting to really unearth, but the study has been going on since like really the seventies and eighties to really find out. Dr. Lee was like a, a real quintessential um, leader in this space where he coined like the term forest bathing in Japan. Uh, which is also known as Shinrin Yuku. So how do we go into a forest and really get the benefits of the forest and what happens to our cortisol levels, um, our blood levels and like oxygen, like how we are really, we just become calm uh, within like 20 minutes of like walking in a forest. And it lasts, it's like, it's not just like that 
moment in time, but that's a cumulative experience. So this is another really interesting, cool, like I, I'm always blown away by this. So um, Shinrin Yuko and forest bathing, you get to walk in the woods. Even if you're in Chicago or wherever you might be, like even in New York City, there are conifer trees, which are pine trees or cedar trees. When you're walking around these trees, of conifers, they release something called phytoncides. And phytoncides are aerosols that they're just kind of like almost bathing themselves in to ward off disease and illness. We don't know it. But we can't smell it. We can't see it. We can't, you know, anything. But when we're around it, uh, we're inhaling these aerosols. So when we in inhale these phytoncides, they actually kick off our NK cells, which are natural killer cells. And these natural killer cells ward off disease and illness within humans. And it's mind-blowing that like, just being on trees it's almost like getting like getting a multivitamin every day um and again it's a cumulative effect so dr lee talks about the cancer ratios with people that are around conifer trees versus those that are not i don't teach that because i'm not a doctor or a scientist but he is so there's tons of studies um, that he's been doing in japan for decades around cancer and conifer trees and it's mind-blowing really mind-blowing it's so fascinating to hear about all these like healing effects of, of just different, you know, plants and, and trees and, and mm -hmm. so many, you know, aspects of nature that um, truly without even knowing if you're just around them in their presence or visualizing them can yeah. have those benefits. So what are some of the benefits um, from being out in nature or if you're even experiencing it synthetically at home. Yeah, it's um it's so cool because even if you like look at nature for 40 seconds, it actually re like it kind of takes you out like you're we have so many tabs open in our brains just like a computer. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden it kind of resets us back into like, okay, we can focus much better. We have like a much clearer uh, ability to like just be present. Um, it helps us lower our blood pressure. It um, boosts our um, our creativity lowers lowers ability, um, diabetes, uh, heart rate, like all these things. Like it's it's literally like taking a pill every day, and all you have to do is just witness uh, and and be present in it, and just being like, wow, I'm I'm noticing the trees around me. Like right now, I'm sure like Chicago and New York. I'm like, oh, the blooms are so beautiful, mm -hmm. and just because I didn't, you know, I didn't know. I lived in Florida for 15 years, and when I came to New York in 2010. I was like walking my dog in the park every day, but I never thought of it as like experience for myself. I thought of it as an experience for my dog because she was like a big, almost like a shepherd. I need, you know, she needed a lot of exercise. Right. So then, <laughs> yeah, I was like, it's not for me, it's for her. Mm -hmm. And then when she passed away a few years later, I was going to the park more than when I had her. I'm like, okay, that's weird because we used to spend at least an hour a day, if not more in the park. And now it's like going every morning and then every evening. And I was like, oh, my God, it wasn't for her. It was for me. Because then I started like witnessing, like, oh, I didn't know ginkgo, ginkgo trees were in New York City. How, how did I not know this before? And it's like one of the most uh, prominent trees in New York is ginkgo, biloba. I'm like, why do we, we eat ginkgo and we, yeah. we use it in our beauty products? How is that possible? So it's just really cool. Like once we start going outdoors, then we start wanting to kind of learn more and also this like environmentalist kind of part becomes the, the part of this like discovery is like oh, the more you understand the more you want to protect it because you're like oh that's so cool i didn't realize ginkgo trees are growing here i didn't know cherry blossoms and how did they get how did cherry blossoms get to my street and if they're not doing well like how do i protect that because i want you know my grandchildren or my you know great great grandchildren or people in my family to see it you know, hundred years from now, what what is the world going to look like? Um, so I think people have such a short term plan. Like, what's how do we think things like the next five to ten years? But I always think about the hope for like what a hundred years can look like uh, from now. Like, what Chicago can look like so green, like the rooftops can be green, the buildings can be more like lush with like green sides. Because then, if we have more green around us, it also protects us from keeping our our spaces much cooler in the summer without mm -hmm. having to use air conditioning. Um, they're doing it like um, Singapore is like the leading country in the world that is really leading the space in like biophilia and biophilic design. So biophilia is our innate love of all living things. We have it within us. So biophilic design is like bringing nature indoors. And how do we first be educated on why? Because once we understand why, you're like, oh, okay, 
I get it. Like, I understand, like, why did I put wood in my apartment, my tiny little apartment here in New York City 10 years ago when I moved in, which I wasn't supposed to do, but I did anyway because <laughs> I've been wrenching. But um, mm -hmm. I put this like giant wood wall in my apartment because it makes me feel good and it's much warmer than it not being there. I didn't know, like, I don't know why I did it, but I was like, oh, that looked that look like a pretty accent wall. Um, I know I wasn't supposed to do it, but I've been here so long. They're like, oh, like, you know, people come. I probably like, that's really cool. I didn't know you could do that. I'm like, you probably can't, but I put it in there anyway. Put it and, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, I put it in there. But, and then like, I also put like uh, on my YouTube, on my TV, I'll play like a fireplace because we have our innate connection to hearing fire or like mm -hmm. watching a fireplace. Again, this yeah. is also going back to like, going back to like how we were, you know, a millennia ago, fire meant fire protects us, fire feeds us, um, fire keeps us warm. So, you know, back in the day, we were all of a sudden learning how to cook food. So all of a sudden we're like, oh, fire brings us, you know, nutrients, um, keeps us protected from any other species that are trying to attack us, but also keeps us warm from the elements. So we have this innate connection to like fire uh when we see it in a fireplace or yeah, a bonfire I didn't think of that because everyone likes to have a fireplace um even yes. if it's a fake, a fake light you know which, yes. which is what I, have. I have a faux fireplace you can actually I see get it, it. Me. yeah <laughs> okay and yeah it just like it's like led flames and it doesn't matter if yeah it's like, oh, turn it on at night there's something soothing about that even a candle right like the, yeah. the flame of a candle there's something very soothing about that it's just um i never thought about why these things make me feel good i it, never did you yeah, but it's so, but it makes so much sense, right? So it's like there's so much common sense that we already innately know, but we've been kind of t not even taught why. So like again, like these four walls are like you're going to school, you're going to work, outside is outside, and that's separate from who we are. But we're like we grew up, we were we were <laughs> created outside. We spent more time outdoors than as a human species than we have indoors, and our bodies cannot catch up to yeah. what we've put it through and even like sounds um we talk about so i have a, a podcast with my co-host monica uh, olson called biophilic solution so how do we and i've learned so much about like little things like sound so when you hear like jarring sounds it takes our bodies 23 minutes to get back to where it was you know like a calm state 23 minutes like oh my gosh because it's an assault on our body it's like a micro yeah. trauma these all these traumas all day long, like living in Chicago, living in New York, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm jarred by the honking horn right next to my body when I'm walking down the street, which happened today. Uh, when I was walking to brunch, I thought, okay, that just like my I almost had a heart attack because it was like right next to you. And um, it's not good for us. It's really not good for us. So I think once we, we learn why nature is important in our daily lives, we then want to spend more time understanding like, okay, I've got a few plants. I'm glad they're still alive, you know, and <laughs> connections to animals are also innately within us to keep us healthy and strong. Um, and what's also interesting too, when you do some studies around children that were raised on farms um, and outdoors, they have primarily like 96% less allergies than those that live in cities because they're connected to animals and dirt and you know, all the things that come with being on from a farm. Very start, yeah. Yeah. From the, from an early age. So they, they don't have like this, we're so separate. We're so like clean all the time that we're so afraid to touch anything like the pandemic. We were so terrified to touch anything. Uh, I worried about that for a long time. I'm sure you like, you understand like living in Chicago, like being in Absolutely. New York city during a pandemic, you didn't want to touch anything. So I was trying to tell everyone to go outside touch a tree, touch a plant, get your hands dirty, and uh, you're going to be much better off than you would be like just isolating yourself in a, in a you know, just like, like a, a place where you're totally closed off from fresh air and, and uh, all the things that you really need to survive and thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, I, um, I didn't realize how much I needed to get outside during the pandemic. Um, you know, like we were we were pent up inside for such a long time, and oh. it, you know, all these campaigns of stay at home, stay at home. So like, you know, I'm, we're being wired to like, okay, stay at home. And yeah. then I, I remember I was like struggling. Um, you know, I, I've I've always seen a therapist, and I, I've been very open about mental health mm -hmm. and um, my my well being. And so after losing connection to people and I live, you know, by myself, I'm alone. Mm -hmm. So I had 
it was it was a struggle, but I I don't think that there was any release. Um, and one day my therapist was like, why don't you just go for a walk in nature? Like that's not going to hurt anybody. And so I did that. And I, this is when I discovered this gem of a park near me that I didn't know, even know ex existed. And, wow. um, it was really beautiful. And then like, once I got to the top of this, like really huge hill, um, and then there's like a pathway that cleared and came down to a pond area. And I sat wow. down on a rock and I just started crying out of nowhere. Uh, and there was nothing that prompted yeah. my you know those emotions yeah. it's not like something happened that led to you know me yeah. crying or whatever but um I, it was just so random and weird and then when I talked to my therapist therapist about it at the next session she's like this is the release I'm talking about you're mm. you just didn't know that you needed wow. that I think like nature just helped you do that like it yeah helped you get rid of all that pent up <laughs> you know. Negativity. Nature is a therapist. So we always talk about nature as a therapist. Some people are just guides. So I always feel like I'm a guide to just introduce people like it's normal. And that people innately know, like you knew, like, oh my gosh, I know I should be here. But I, I know exactly how you feel because there were so many times during the pandemic here in the city and we were forced, like, you need to be inside. You need, and I was trying to tell people, just go outside for a few minutes every day, go for a while. And people are, don't do that, don't do that. It's dangerous. But um we need to be outside because our bodies, that's where we heal. Like you look back at like the 1918, um, the Spanish flu, and they were like putting people in tents outside <laughs> to go to heal. I'm like, see, we were doing it then. Like you got to get outside. But like you just yeah. said about this healing of like the weeping because it felt so good just to have like the fresh air and the sunlight or yeah. just a, bree a breeze on your skin. It's, um, it's this awareness that are, it's so beautiful it's so beautiful and it's so profound once you once you say, okay, I know what this feels, and you acknowledge it. And you're like, oh my God, this feels so good. I forgot how good this feels. Um, I think that's the key to like opening up this door of like, wow, I need to understand more of how it impacts, especially brain health um, and why we have to have it a part of our day every day. And especially for young children, like it's mm -hmm. profound in, in like children's development. And I'm so thankful that my parents let me eat mud pies as a kid, but whatever, that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Growing up in the Bronx, I don't know if that was really safe, but I'm still here. So that's all that matters. But um, <laughs> they, they never stopped me from doing what I was doing and riding, like jumping in puddles in the Bronx. But, um, but yeah, I think it's important that we let kids be kids and just get dirty and not be afraid mm -hmm. to let kids get dirty. We have to For sure. get ourselves. Yeah. You mentioned start. that you were trying to do something in the school system. What is that? What are you trying to um, hopefully see happen with, with the way so that children we're trying, are trying? Yeah, we're trying to get, there's so many great programs out there, like the Children and Nature Network. Um, they're based out of Atlanta and they're doing like Richard Louvre is one of the most incredible um, thought leaders in the space. He wrote a book 25 years ago maybe long, 30 years ago, called Last Child in the Woods. And he coined the term nature deficit disorder. So he's been studying children in nature for decades. Um, so his his um, his business or his uh, foundation is a children nature network. But what we really want to do is get more children, more teachers teaching kids or getting more kids outdoors during the day, like not forest, not necessarily teaching the forest, um, but being outdoors, being able to like teach classes outdoors. Um, and get more kids because so many programs were cut off during the pandemic, like outdoor play. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so many different things because once you start studying, uh, Bill Browning um, is the lead architect and founder of Terrapin, Terrapin Bright Green. It's, it's incredible. He's been doing incredible work in biophilic design and they've been doing studies in schools where children, so they like play bird song in a classroom in one classroom and then no bird song in another, the children that heard like just sounds of birds did higher on their test scores than those that did not. Like it's, it's so simple, right? It's so simple, but there are yeah. such profound changes in our brains when we are understanding like, oh, we're hearing, not even that we're recognizing that there are bird song around us or the rattling of trees or leaves or like even the visual of leaves on a carpet, like coming through uh, blinds when we like see patterns we are feeling more comfortable and more at ease in a space. Um, so we feel healthier, we feel better, we feel more in tune than like a cold, cold, stark space where like, oh, this makes me feel rigid and not comfortable. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that's why you see a lot more stores, a lot more businesses are interested in biophilia and biophilic design, especially trying to get people back into a mall, back into their offices, <coughs> excuse me, back into places where they want people to go indoors. They're like, oh, we need more nature. Yeah. So it's been nice I, to be I a part of these conversations. Like visiting our, our, our neighborhood floor shop, floor shop all the time just because I just love being inside of there and it just – everything from the aromas to the you know aesthetics yeah. is like just pulls me in even if i'm not going to buy something because i've walked out of there with way too much i have like a right. ton of well, plants it's, it's innately in you like you don't even realize yeah. why you're doing it right but it's just yeah. like how we were how we're like uh, our bodies are Wired, always yeah. craving and we don't even know it but we're like oh that feels good but it's because yeah. that's how humans uh how were created for sure yeah, yeah. i never realized that like our bodies do crave nature. We just don't always realize it. And my dad always used to say to me too that, you know, and nature has always provided solutions. Like mm. all, all of our, the solutions to our problems are there. Yeah. You yeah. can find them in, in nature, which is really wonderful um, that, you know, the world was just created this way. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. Um, I know you said something really important earlier about how when you know the the why of why we connect to nature and when we um, realize how important it is to our, is to our well-being, we have this uh, innate desire to protect it. And with Earth Day coming up, and there's mm. obviously been a lot of attention around um, climate change and, uh, you know, trying to, you know, have some action around it. Um, what are some things that we could be doing, um, all of us, on a daily basis, some small things that we could be doing to help preserve the environment around us? I'm so glad you said that because I think so much about, you know, it's Earth Day coming up and it's there's so much climate doomism, like, oh, God, we only have five years left or we only have <laughs> there's so much like bleakness. But I am always so thankful because I think our conversations that I have and that um, we have in our podcast, it's always about hope. So nature is all about like thriving and growth and expansion and hope. So there's so much we can do. And I think it's even, so my, my mission is always like, we can't expect people to wanna to protect the planet on Earth Day or protect the planet on any day if we're not getting outside. Like you said in the intro, it's like we're spending like 95% of our time indoors. So we cannot expect people to try and protect the planet if we're not even going in our own backyard a few hours a day, a few hours a week even. So I think the first step, all I want people to do is spend more time outside because once we spend more time going outdoors in our own neighborhood, taking a walk around the block and seeing mm -hmm. the trees and seeing how things ebb and flow, that's when you're like, oh my God, I didn't know. And then you start witnessing the life around you. That's when the real um, environmentalist, the like you conservationist, like you want to start protecting because you're like, oh, this is beautiful. How do I then protect it? So I always say there's so many things we can do, use less water, you know, but I think the first honest in my heart of hearts, I think the first step we have to do is get outside. Yeah. Um, that way we understand what's around us because I think globally is such a big, like giant thought, but if we can think like so small, and doesn't like once we like step outside, we start understanding. Then I start like looking at like what am I bringing into my home? What am I, what am I eating? Um, where's my food coming from? The fabrics that are in my clothes to my furniture. It, it, it becomes this like very small step, but every small step makes a huge change uh, from how I wash my clothes to how I, you know, how I do I get rid of my, you know, things or my garbage in, in a New York City apartment. Like, it's always like little things, but they all make a difference. But I think we cannot think these big things unless we start really, really small and granular. And that's going to be getting outside first more often than you ever have before. And you can even start really small, right? Like just go out there for what, five minutes? Yeah, but go outside. Just like take a walk around your block. You live in Chicago or New York. Walk around your block. Like see what's around you. See the trees. Mm -hmm. Listen to the birds. Like look at the buds. On like, oh, I didn't know. What is that? What is that? So I love that now. Like the new iPhone, you can take a picture of a plant and it will say mm -hmm. what the plant is. Because I'm always like, oh, that's cool. I don't oh, need I like know that. I, I have an iPhone. Yeah. I did not know. So about the this. new iPhone, you take there's like a little info button now, and it will give you exactly like what the plant is or what oh, the tree so is. Cool. Yeah. So we get to learn. Yeah. And I think that's the key is like education. 
is mm -hmm. like the the single most important part and it gets exciting because then Agreed. you're like a child we, we're discovering things all the time and then yeah. discovery like leads to um how do we protect that's what it is yeah i love that so get outside and get curious yes explore, exactly explore exactly your environment yeah yeah that, that's amazing to hear um before we go i do want to ask you um what are you what are you working on right now what's next for you what are you um getting into into this uh, as you continue um evolving in this space of of making people aware and the education piece you were talking about with um connecting to nature there's so many exciting things like even just going to upenn and talking to the neuroscience so i want to go deeper into like what's happening to our brains in nature. So that's my real, uh, that's my real discovery. Like I really, really want to focus on our, our brain and nature and our brain without nature. So I'm excited to like partner with some really good like neuro teams. Um, and doing the walk with uh, walk your way calm book has been great getting more people outdoors. I'm working with hotel groups, corporations. Um, it's kind of fun because I get to just bring teams and people just again, it takes like one step outside. And then people that can take it back to their families, their community, their own companies. And it's these little minute things that make a huge a ripple effect. Uh, and been, again, being in New York City, I get to talk to these hotel groups. And now that tourism's coming back, I get to work with lots of tourists um, here. And also I do a lot of brand activations around the country that are like new sneaker launches. And, you know, it's, it's so it's a way to kind of keep going with that message of like, how do we get outside? Small yeah. doses like have like huge implications. Oh, I love that. Start small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the way that you put that into perspective is really important because it, the issue of climate change does feel really heavy and large. Yeah, doesn't day, it? But, but when you yeah. put it into that lens of like, you can start small by just getting outside and that mm -hmm. the rest will start to flow. That's such a great way to look at it. So Thanks. Thank you for that nugget of inspiration. Um, and for those who want to learn a little bit more about Jennifer's work and uh, what she's up to, you can follow her on um, social media, on Instagram at, at the Jennifer Walsh. Her website is walkwithwalsh.com. Um, is there anything else any that people should be following, checking out? Um, we have our podcast, which is Biophilic Solutions. And you can find it like on all your favorite platforms because we have some really interesting conversations that are mind blowing to me about like lawns. I didn't know about like I didn't know how lawns came into being in the US and it changed my whole idea about what a lawn is like. And anyway, we have really cool conversations yeah. um, across the board, all the industries. So it's it's been really fascinating. So biophilicsolutions.com is also like our, our podcast. But it's really lots of learnings, lots of lessons there. Yeah. I'm, I'm so thank you so for having intrigued. me. Yeah, I'm so fascinated that I can't wait to tune in and learn more about this myself. And in fact, it's so beautiful out in Chicago today that I'm going to get outside now. So me I'm gonna, too. <laughs> I'm about to leave as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go for a walk. I feel very inspired. And for those listening, I hope you do that too. Thank you so much for spending some time with us, Jennifer. This has been really, thank really. You know. Wonderful. It's beautiful to be wonderful. with you again. Thank you for the space that you've created to have these conversations. And I'm so happy to see you. Even it's virtual. I'm just oh I'm God. very thankful. I'm thankful that we've stayed in touch all this time. So yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah I appreciate you. Me too. Yeah, I can't you. wait to see you in person and go for a walk together. Me too. All right, everyone. Um, take care and we will see you next time. Hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, and I really hope you did. Please subscribe to the show on your favorite streaming service so that you're notified when new episodes are posted. Also, be sure to follow The Quo on social media at The Quo Media across all platforms for the latest and greatest. Thanks again for joining, supporting, and uplifting The Quo community, or as I like to call it, our cohort. Catch you next time.